Hello, hi, my name is uh, Raphael, for those who don't know me, which is mostly all of you. Um, the, the brisket is coming and the chicken is also coming, I promise you. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. I just wanted to thank the Black Tie Dinner for not only inviting me to be part of this special night, but for making me feel welcomed and at home. Um, and also for simply existing. Uh, thank you, the Black Tie Dinner, for fighting for two-spirit, LGBTQIA plus rights, and equality as your mission. It is with immense gratitude, immense gratitude that I accept the Vanguard Award. Um, if, if, if I'm going to be completely honest, I, uh, yeah, um, if I'm going to be completely honest, I, I have never have, I've never had to write an acceptance speech before. I usually say thank you and um, I mind my business. Um, I'm a, I'm a very proud and quiet introvert. Shout out to my introverts. Um, you know, the acting business, the theater business is funny. You know, I, I try my best not to let this world define me, but I'm in an industry that simply loves to categorize and pigeonhole looks and careers, but I would sincerely be lying to you if I did not confess that I am very proud to be part of not only this beautiful queer community, but to be standing here as a queer Latino, my immigrant fucking community. And like I said, I, 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 I've, you know, I, like saying thank you for like 10 minutes has never been my forte, but uh, in my inspiration tonight, I stumbled upon Oscar winning screenwriter Dustin Lance Black's speech made here at the Black Dinner several years ago. And his speech was compelling. He talked about his mother. He my mom is very, very important to me. Uh, he talked about coming out to his mother and, and, and having friends over his, his, his family's house and um, his mother kind of finding out that he was gay through his friends. And, um, but he said in the way that, he said that the only way to change minds is to tell your own story. And if it's okay with you all, I'm, I'm I mean, I'm not here to change minds, but I'm just here to tell you a little bit about me, if that's okay. Um, I come from a family of farmers. Um, I was born and raised in Brazil. I, I have a huge family. My, mom, my dad is one of four. My mom is one of 17. Um, and I grew up spending a lot of time at the farm. Uh, as uh, I imagine Texans know, uh, you know, riding horses, herding cattle, Chasing chickens, I, I did that, you know, because when the chickens have their chicks and like, it's very cute and you just want to hold it and grab it. Um, or maybe that's just me. Um, and I also ran away from geese. If you didn't know, geese have very sharp teeth. This is a microphone. Uh, geese have very sharp teeth. Um, and um, uh, needless to say, I grew up with a lot of freedom. I, I had a wonderful childhood. Um, it was only in 2002 that my father decided to move to the United States. He wanted a better life. He wanted us to have a better life. And uh, when he left, I was eight, my, dad, my brother was two. And although my father called every day, sometimes twice a day for five years, my mother had had enough uh, of the distance and decided that, I mean, a divorce was out of the question for her and her husband. She told my father to find a bigger place because she was coming home with the kids. My, mo my brother and I, uh, we moved to the United States in July of 2007 to live as a unit um, with my father. And if, I'm, and if I'm being frank, my mom is a little bit crazy because you have to be like an audacious and determined son of a bitch to pack your bags and move to another country with your kids without knowing the language, the culture, or if you've ever going to be able to feed yourself or your fucking family.
And I would like to invite anyone, I would like to invite anyone who has ever thought that it was easy to leave your country with no financial means necessary or guaranteed in search of a better life for yourself and your family to open up your mind and perhaps just perhaps embrace the possibility that, you know, you might be wrong. We had our dad as an anchor to ground us, but something that one has to learn quickly that when one moves to the United States, I'm gonna say that again, when one moves to the United States, opportunity does exist here. You just have to be willing to work and work and work. When I first arrived in the United States, I, I didn't speak English. I moved to Harrison, New Jersey. It was a small town populated mostly with immigrants and first generation immigrants. I didn't know if y'all remember middle school, but you know, middle school, in middle school, the devil comes out in these kids. They're really freaking mean. Um, their own families, you know, I, I, I don't blame them because their own families were, were too busy surviving as well. Uh, things were tough for everyone. I used to come back home stressed out. My mom used to give me massages at the end of the day because I'd be so stressed out. I'd be losing my hair. My lips out of stress were colorless. One day, um, one day that occupied my mind. And in order to occupy my mind, I, I learned history. I read a lot. Um, as a 13 year old, I had this thought that if I can understand how people think in this country, and where they come from, then I can survive here. And I can be here and earn the right to, to speak my voice here. I practiced a lot. I practiced to get rid of my accent. Yo, I moved here when I was 13. I, I, I practiced a lot. I used to open up the history book, history book just to, just to read and write and practice just to get rid of my accent because kids were bullying me. But isolating myself, not only made me repulse the idea of isolating with people, I didn't feel like befriending people. Um, and it was very hard to me, I, 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 I became really shy. It wasn't just simply moving to this country that made me implode, I knew that I didn't stare. I knew that I didn't stare at boys simply because I admired their outfits. There was something more. Coming from Brazil, a Latin American country where machismo culture was the key to the door of manhood. I felt myself becoming less and less capable of unlocking the confidence to be me. I barely had the courage to ask a question in class in the fear of sounding stupid. Um, in my junior year of high school, in my high school class, I, I was assigned to do a project on Maya Angelou. I had to give a presentation on her life and how she contributed to the civil rights movement. I did my research. I practice, and once again, once again, I practice. I wanted to prove myself, and my biggest fear was, my biggest fear was public speaking. After three months of having arrived in the U.S., I had to give a presentation in my computer class. As a reminder, I did not know English. I stood in front of the class, and you know, you know when someone introduces you to a language, so like, what, whatever new language. And they ask you to regurgitate what the language sounds to you, and you just make up some gibberish words. Well, in that presentation, that's exactly what I, that's exactly what I did. Um, the only thing that kept me from running away from that class was the sweet face of my teacher, encouraging me to keep going. That was Mrs. Mrs. Winterblack. She was very kind. Um, so this time I was determined through my attempt of explaining why Maya, Maya was the boss and I wanted to stand and face everyone, metaphorically and literally. I was determined to prove myself, but mostly those who ever called me weak, whoever called me a faggot, whoever called me a legal spick, that I was none of those things, but someone who my parents could be proud of. I wanted to, I wanted to prove myself, I wanted to prove to myself that my voice was enough. Yo, listen, the brisket is coming. The chicken is coming. I know I'm talking a lot. Hold, hold up. When my name was picked, I stood up excitedly. I, 
I walked to the front of the class. When I looked over my shoulder to everyone, I froze. To be, to be completely honest, my face and body started to sweat. My hands started to shake. My body started to give out. And bro, I shat my fucking pants in class, giving a fucking presentation in history and Maya Angelou. And I was really embarrassed to be there. Not embarrassed about what happened in class, but embarrassed to be occupying space without a purpose. I was so entrapped in my own misconception of myself. Lies I believed others told me of me that I did not belong there, that I did not deserve to be there. So I decided if I'm going to face the storm, I'm, I'm going to be in the eye of the hurricane. I'm going to stop hiding. I'm going to put myself in the scariest place on earth, which is underneath the light, visible to everybody. I left the bathroom, I walked out of the, I left the bathroom, I walked to the drama club hallway, arrived at a pin sign up audition sheet at the board next to the entrance of the theater and wrote Rafael Silva to audition for Anne of Green Gables. The following week, I found out I broke, I booked the role of Mr. Sadler. He only had six lines. Today I find myself in an extremely fortunate position. I'm currently part of a hit television show on Fox called 911 Lone Star, created and produced by Tim Minear and Ryan Murphy. Ryan Murphy, it is a series that tells complex and nuanced stories about the lives and relationships of first responders, and it takes place here in the great state of Texas. I play the character of police officer named Carlos Reyes, an out and proud queer man, a Texan, a Tejano, who was, who was in a beautiful same-sex relationship with paramedic TK Strand, played by Ronan Rubenstein. TK and Carlos, affectionately named by the fans as Carlos, are engaged and soon to be married. It doesn't escape me for a moment the irony of having such storyline uh, taking place in the state of Texas right now. And what I love most about this, this type of storyline existing on network television is that it will come into your home without your asking for it. It reaches wider, wider audi audience at, at one time. I have had fans confess through social media that they were able to begin a conversation about their sexuality and about sexual orientation with their conservative family members because they were casually watching TV and the show came on and so did TK and Carlos. You cannot underestimate the power of representation. I did not grow up acting. In fact, in Brazil, I did not grow up watching television or playing video games, spending time on the computer. I had had much knowledge. I hadn't had much knowledge of the United States or, you know, what was even or what it looked like prior to my coming here. I resorted to media, TV, film, to learn how to behave here, to learn my place and where to go. Yo, I'm gonna repeat that again. I know we're all talking and we're really excited for the, for, for the dinner. But I'm gonna tell you again, I relied on media, TV, and film to learn how to behave here. Y'all do the same. I do the same. I did not see myself in TV and film back then, or really right now, according to the 2021 study by the Latitude, a business-based national or initiative focused on helping U.S. Latinos, U.S. Latinos in business, media, politics, science, and technology. Sol Trujillo, one of the co-founders, stated that Latinos make up nearly 30% of every professional sector. In the same study for media, however, it was discovered that less than 3% of leads in film and TV right now are Latinos. Mathematics hasn't always been my forte, but less than 3% presence in media does not equate to 30% 30 ca 30 carrying the load. I wish I had a Carlos growing up. I wish I had a Carlos on TV growing up. I did not say this because I'm, you know, because I'm, I'm playing the guy, but you know, here's a nuanced character, a police officer. Some might say that he's the epitome of a strong, a strong man, a Latino, descendant of immigrants. And after all of that, he's still queer. Representation can, 
quite literally saved lives. How many of us have had to listen a song, watch the movie, or watch the TV show through a hard time to bring us comfort, some solace, closure, or even company? A piece of, a piece of art where we see ourselves is a source of freedom to the heart. And um, before I go, I, I, you know, I, I, I know I haven't talked a lot, but um, we're not here tonight, but, um, but I, they are not here tonight, but I just wanted to thank my parents for showing me what love looks like. I've been blessed in this lifetime for having selfless and loving parents. Y'all, I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but people don't, but people don't leave everything and everyone they know the comfort of knowing their own culture and language, the likeness of the likeness and familiarity of their own people and move to an unknown land full of life altering obstacles, traumatic experiences, simply because things become inconvenient. They do it because there's simply no other option. I'm not only speaking for myself here, I'm speaking to the people that are picking up our, your plates, that are cleaning your space, that are clearing your freaking fucking glasses. All the immigrants here, all the Mexican immigrants here, everyone that you see here. I have seen firsthand how, how much my parents sacrificed for me to be here today. I am eternally grateful for them. I once again would like to thank the Black Tie Dinner for inviting me to join this beautiful event tonight. I also wanted to thank, honestly, I wanted to thank all of you for, for allowing me to share a part of me with you. Um, thank you all for listening, sincerely. The chicken is coming, the brisket is coming. I hope you all have a great rest of your, your night tonight.